You are never going to break the world record. Now, remember our patient from earlier? Let's head back to the emergency department to see how they're getting along. Back in Manchester is 11-year-old Akrima with a badly broken arm. Akrima was in PE. It was gymnastics and feeling like a pro, he took a run-up towards a bench and jumped. Perfect. Landed on his feet. Beautiful. And then fell over and broke his arm. Yeah, really not good. The broken bones have changed the shape of Akrima's arm and it's as bendy as a banana. Now it's time for his operation, where specialist surgeons will put his bones back in the right place. So, banana arm, get ready to be de bananified This is some sleepy medicine now. What would you dream about? Where's the nicest place we can have a little sleep? France, the Caribbean. It's a black pool. Black pool? Yes. Yeah. OK, black pool it is. As soon as Akrima drifts off into dreamland, the surgical team will be able to get to work. And there you go. He's off to the sandy shores of Blackpool. To prevent Akrima's bones from healing in the wrong shape, the surgeons need to move them by hand back to where they should be. We just push this part of the forearm back straight up so that it lines up with this part of the forearm. Remember, he won't feel a thing. So, on your marks, get set. And there you go. A blink of an eye and the bone is back in the correct position. Everything looks good, but to be sure, they do another X-ray. Oh, beautiful. Not a hint of banana there. Now they plaster his arm in a cast so that the bone stays in position to knit together. A couple of hours later, a creamer is wide awake and the operation is a distant memory. Actually, it's barely a memory at all. I don't remember anything. I only remember when I, when I woke up. But it's good news. I don't have the banana arm anymore. It's gone. You must be starving, a creamer. Fancy a banana? Every time I eat a banana, I try not to think about uh, my own. Maybe stick to apples and oranges for a bit. Bye! <laughs> Five-year-old Maxton turns up feeling a bit patchy. I hurt my eye and, and it really hurts. Well, you seem cheery enough about it. What's it like under there? Not too bad. Disgusting. Disgusting? Oh, dear. How did this happen? Maxton was at school. It was break time and he was balancing on some tree stumps. Nice headband, Maxton. He was jumping across to the other side of a dangerous swamp. The red monkeys were cheering him on. And there it was, the treasure. With a burst of speed, he hopped across when... Oh, no! He lost his balance! And he crashed his face into a tree stump. Ouch! Off to hospital for Maxton. Good walk, Maxton. Hold on, watch where you're going. You'll do the other eye in. Phew. Here's Dr Gemma McLeod to have a look at Maxton. What's happened to you today? I bumped my eye and it was all bleeding. Do you think we can have a little look at this head? Yeah, come on. Time to reveal all. Oh, dear. Where's the end of your eyebrow gone? Is it painful across here? Um, no, no, it's only this side. Just this side. And this side's all OK, yeah? Yeah, it's OK. All oh, my body is OK, except for the eye. That's it. Look on the bright side. So, how are we going to fix them up, Dr Gemma? I think we might need to glue that head injury that you've got there. We need to bring it back together. He doesn't look impressed. I don't want to laugh at me at school. They won't laugh at you at school. Imagine if my head was um, cracked together. You could to glue my whole head like that. Round my face, too. Ending up? It's on my nose. Right. I don't think that's going to happen. Although it looks quite nasty at the moment, it should come together quite nicely with our special glue. Dr Gemma's right. It is quite nasty. But imagine if his whole head was cracked open and we had to glue his whole head. Don't you start, Chris. You're so brave. Do you know this, Maxton? I tell you, I wish they were all like you. That's it. You've done it. Well done. You were brilliant. Yeah. With the gluing over, the nurse applies some small plasters called steri strips to make sure the cut stays closed. And that's it. Let's give Maxton a big hand. Uh, not quite what I had in mind. Yes! Bye! Bye, I've got a glove on. Earlier, we saw Sam in accident in emergency. I wonder if he's had a poo. Hmm. Let's find out. Back in Manchester, budding boxer Sam is in hospital with a troublesome tummy. 
He'd been fast asleep, dreaming of a boxing victory. Watch out for his fists. But a battle was brewing in his belly. I wouldn't mess with them. As the stabbing pains took hold, Sam woke up with a seriously sore stomach. X-rays revealed Sam was severely constipated, basically needed a big poo. He's managed to have one, but a second X-ray shows there's still plenty of poo to come out. They've cleared the left side, but now there's a lot of poo on the right side. Enter Dr Alex Turner, a man with a plan to banish that blockage for good. We're just going to insert a nasogastric tube, so that's a tube that's going to pass um, down the nose and into the stomach, um, so we can administer a special medicine. This tube means the medicine can get straight to the poo, soften it up and hopefully help Sam go to the loo. So, with the medicine making its way to the pile-up, there's only one thing left to do. Wait. Any luck? Not so much as a sniff. Any joy? No, I think we might be here a while. Come on, Sam, still nothing? Nope. How many times has he tried to go? I've lost count. Several toilet trips later, do we have a result? Oh, goodness, for that. Hooray, it's a knockout. The poo has come at last, the big poo. <laughs> I feel great, finally it's, the poo has come out. I bet you do. It was one big blockage. Got to really watch now what Sam eats. I mean, like, he's got to cut down on these sweets and, you know, the fizzy pop that he drinks. Uh, pizzas, burgers, cheeseburgers. Yep, and drink plenty of water. So remember, if you want to do do do, don't 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 eat too much junk. I just can't wait to get back to boxing. Now, this place may look like a hairdresser's, but it isn't. They're getting rid of lice. They're very common. I've had them. And no matter what anyone says, they're not dangerous and they don't care if your hair's clean or dirty. They just love to live in it. You can use special shampoos to get rid of these troublesome parasites, but this girl has come for the five-star treatment. Meet 11-year-old Courtney. What's it like to have lice? I've had them four times and they're really irritating because you're always scratching your head in the middle of school lessons. My mum's always told me not to worry because you can always get rid of them. Well, that's good advice from your mum. Lice are totally treatable. Before they go any further, I'm going to have a look at what we're dealing with face to face. Crikey! Now, they may look icky, but lice are very common. Studies have shown that as many as one in three children are likely to get head lice during the year. So how do we get rid of them? Meet Justine Armitage. She's a head louse's worst nightmare, and she's got a rather special technique. We'll hoover Courtney's hair with a specialist lice hoover. Did she say lice hoover? A specialist lice hoover. That's affirmative. For every live lice there is, we'll catch it in the filter so we can count how many there are. Is it quite fun doing it? Is it quite satisfying? Yes, yeah, quite mouth-watering when you see lots. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what we can suck up. Make sure you get into the corners. After a thorough treatment, how's Courtney coping with being, uh, hoovered? Nice. She likes. Time to see what Courtney's bonds has been keeping secret. So we've managed to catch several lice, and you can see them crawling around in here. So why do lice love hair so much? Well, it's warm, it's near a blood supply, your scalp, which is what they feed on, and they can also anchor their eggs to hair, which means they're very safe and well protected. Your hair is the perfect environment for head lice. Lice make you feel itchy because they poo on your head. Now, that's disgusting, but it isn't dangerous, and in fact, it's quite useful because it's the itchiness that lets you know you've got them. Now, we've caught the adult lice, but the next step is to find the eggs. A special fine tooth comb is scraped through Courtney's hair to remove them. Let's see how many we've combed out. Oh, you've got loads. One louse can lay 100 eggs at a time. They're also called nits. A week later, they'll all hatch into lice, and those lice just keep breeding. So at the end of the month, one louse has become a 1,000 head lice. Just as well we've got these guys out. How are you feeling, Courtney? Fabulous. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's head lice. And they're not dangerous, but they are unpleasant. But there are other things that live on your body. Let's investigate. So I've come to see entomologist Vince Smith from the Natural History Museum. So Vince, lice aren't the only things that live harmlessly on our bodies, are they? 
No, that's right. We've also got this other parasite called a Demodex mite. And with these, the older that you are, the more likely you are to have them. So let's see if we can find some. Vince is scraping the skin around my eyes to try and collect enough gunk to test, but he doesn't get much, so we go into my ear. A good pile of gunk on there, so let's see what we can find. I'm sort of hoping he doesn't find anything. Vince is looking through the microscope, and I can see everything he sees on this screen here. <laughs> You're loaded. Oh, look at that. Oh. Oh. Wow. It's moving. Absolutely. That just came out of my ear. That's fantastic. What does he mean, fantastic? Who is this guy? In the daytime, those mites are living inside the little follicles of your hair cells. And then during the nighttime, they come out and they're moving around trying to find all their mates. So every night, there's a bit of a party in my ear. These mites are pretty disgusting, but actually they're not doing me any harm. In fact, they're useful because they help clean the gunk from your ear. We're carrying around all of these passengers, and this is just the start. There are many other human parasites that we've got too. But remember, don't worry, if you ever get lice, it's quite normal and treatable. I've had them. Plus, we all have other little creatures living on us, helping us out with things like the cleaning. Nice work. <laughs> What started off as a normal day for our first patient has ended up with a trip to accident and emergency. But don't worry, he's in the right place. Phew. In Liverpool, 14-year-old Harry has come in with his mum by ambulance following a knock to his head during a rugby match. And then there's everything going yellow and blurry. Okay. And I couldn't walk. A dodgy tackle, perhaps? This might look severe, but the pads around Harry's head are there to keep his head straight. So. How did this happen? Picture the scenes, Zand. A rugby stadium full of cheering fans, and on the pitch is superstar player Harry. Oh, is Harry a famous rugby player? Well, maybe just in his own head. Anyway, with ten minutes left in the game, Harry was determined to score the winning try, and the enthusiastic crowd were right behind him. Gosh, they are right behind him. No, not like that. Supporting him from the stands. Anyway, the opposition had the ball, so Harry raced in for a tackle, but rather than taking the ball, he took a knee to the head and landed on the ground. Ouch! <laughs> Sorting this out today is Dr Anne Kerr. But Harry's got more important things on his mind. Don't cut my kit, please. Harry, we are going to have to cut this off. Everything. <laughs> I only just got this one. Oh, no! But he manages to look on the bright side. At least my kit's not really clean in. Mum's pleased. Dr Anne wants to figure out whether it's Harry's head, neck or spine that's been damaged and will need an X-ray. One, two, three, roll. So the team work together to roll Harry onto his side while keeping his head and body in line. That's because the bones in your neck and back protect the important nerves that run from the brain into the body through your spinal cord. And the doctor decides it's his neck that needs a closer look. And I'll go and book your scans, and then we'll get you up there as soon as the machine's warm. But Harry's still troubled. My kit's come Your kit has come off. You can get a new kit, you can't get a new you, OK? True, Doc. And now it's straight to the CT scan that will check the bones in Harry's head and neck. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Harry. In the emergency department, the medical team are ready for their first patient. Well, let's go meet him. All right, here he comes. Nine-year-old Ethan is in accident and emergency with his dad and stepmom. So what's with the sunglasses? Last night. I felt really dizzy. Then this morning, I went to go give my mum a hug and I just fell down. Ah, so are the sunglasses helping with his head? Well, Chris, I'm glad you asked, because I've been working really hard on this one. <clears throat> Ethan had a severe headache which lasted all night. He woke up in the morning and still didn't feel right. Wait, is this a poem? Yes, it is. Everything Ethan looked at seemed far too bright, so he put on some sunglasses to block out the light. Ah, so that explains the shades. 
He fell over when he tried to stand up right. He was very wobbly and it gave him a fright. Yikes. So what next? He's left his mum's and is off to his dad's. Yes, but Ethan couldn't step up to his dad's front door. His head was hurting more and more. Very good, Zahn, but ouch. Here to find the culprit causing Ethan's mystery headaches is top doctor Reddy Ilavala. So, Ethan, how are you feeling now? Now I feel all right. All right, yeah. But when I was walking earlier, yeah. I had a really bad headache. So if the headache, you know, if it comes, how long it lasts for? Well, last time I had a headache, lasted for, like, two weeks. There could be many offenders causing Ethan's head to hurt. It could be a viral infection, sinusitis or dehydration. But other symptoms, such as sensitivity to light, can mean something more serious. So Dr Reddy needs to do some tests to rule this out. Ah, that's what you look like, Ethan. First, he takes a look at the back of Ethan's eyes. If there's any raised pressure in his brain, this area could become enlarged. My dad is sticking his tongue out. <laughs> With the back of Ethan's eyes looking fine, Dr. Reddy checks they're working normally. N T O. With no obvious problems, further investigation will be required. We have to keep him in the hospital and do the further tests and exactly find out what is it. We'll be back later to see if the doctors can unravel the riddle of Ethan's mystery headaches.